I want to invite everyone to turn with me in your Bibles to the opening chapter of the book of Genesis. If you're just joining us, um, for the last few weeks now, we've been studying the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. I should say we've been studying the opening chapter. Uh, This is the fourth week uh, where we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 1. We're going to make progress forward. We're making progress, but uh, this is an important chapter, and so we're spending some time on it. Um, We're going to begin reading today in verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Um, If you were here last week, we talked about how we relate to God. And I pointed out even last week that this scripture passage in Genesis chapter 1 has some profound things to say about how we are like God. We're made in his image and we're like him in profound ways. But before we could talk about that, this scripture passage also has some things to say about how we're not like God at all. And we talked about how there is this God who, who just stands way above us. And, and there are profound ways where we are nothing like him, even though in our own mind, sometimes we, we puff up our own mind to think that we are. We're nothing like him. He, he's amazing and beyond what we could even begin to think of. We talked about that last week. Now today, uh, we're going to talk about ways in which we are, in fact, like God. And I think this also is just, it's absolutely profound and important to understand as God's people. So beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, as a way of getting into this, I want to just recall to your attention some of the things we've been talking about over the course of the past uh, few weeks. One of the things I've mentioned as we've gone along is that this chapter is unique in the sense that there is a lot of repetition and structure and pattern that you find here. And it's helpful to understand how this works in this chapter when it relates to God's creation of human beings. So I pointed out that you have the repetition of these words, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. And there's this corresponding phrase that comes up as you read through this chapter, and it was so, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. This is a refrain that starts, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God said and it was so. God saw that it was good. God said and it was so. God saw that it was good. Then this phrase, there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. There was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said and it was so and God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. There are these refrains which just pick up and there's this pattern that's established and repeated because God's stamping out his structure on creation. One of the phrases that's important for us to pay attention to today is this phrase, according to their kinds. So when God created the vegetation and the plants, he created them according to their kinds. Every seed-bearing plant according to their kinds and fruit trees according to their kinds. When he created the birds in the sky, he created them according to their kinds. When he created the fish in the sea, he created them according to their kinds. When he created all the animals according to their kinds, the livestock and every living creature that moves along the ground according to their kinds. That's a phrase which is repeated over and over and over again. It just It's like a refrain that builds and every time he creates, it's as though there's this blueprint for birds or for trees or for fish or for animals, this blueprint that God's drawing on and he creates them according to that design. And then God gets to human beings and it's like there's a break in the pattern. 
according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds, and then when he goes to create human beings, you expect again for him to say according to their kinds, but there's a break, there's something different. God said, let us make man, not according to their kinds, but in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his image. There's this break, I, you know, we all catch on to patterns, right? So let's see how quick this group is. Red, 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 red. You should have it by now. Red, 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 red. What's happening? Red, 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 blue. It's like it stands out, like it's supposed to be red, but all of a sudden it's blue. That's what's happening in this passage. According to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds, according to their kinds. No, in his image. It's like there's a break, this is distinct, it's unique, it stands out. In fact, it stands out so much that there's another phrase. You know this phrase, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. Human beings are the last thing that God creates on the sixth day. It's been building to this climax. There's a break in the pattern, according to their kinds, to in his image. And then when God looks at what he's made, look with me at verse 31 of chapter 1. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. It stands out. Human beings are this unique creation of God, not like anything else. And uh, this is such an important concept that we are unique. We uniquely are made in his image. Uh, Look with me at chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 4 which describes God creating Adam. So this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And this is so important. When God goes to form human beings, there is this material, I'll even call it earthiness to him. I mean, he's taken from the the earth, from the ground. And so there's this way in which, yes, we are material. But then something special about us, God breathes into our nostrils the breath of life. And there's something about us that's not just merely material or earthy. We have this spiritual side to us, this soul that comes from God, this immaterial side of us that is uniquely ours. God has breathed into us something of himself, which if you spend some time thinking about it, explains a lot of things. Like seventh grade math. You walk into a seventh grade math classroom and you'll find a teacher saying things like this to students. Students, suppose you have two groups of apples and we'll call one group group X and one group group Y. And suppose... Group Y has one less than two times the number of apples in group X. And group X has three apples in it. How many are in group Y? And seventh graders will sit there and they're like, okay, Y equals 2X minus 1. X equals 3. So Y equals 2 times 3 minus 1. And Johnny will raise his hand and say, Miss Teacher, it's 5. And the teacher will say, that's right. You do not find elephants doing this. You just don't. I mean, we are, we are fundamentally able to do things. We have these capacities that no other creature has. I mean, our, biz- our ability to have reason and logic, our intellect, it, it's not like we're just one shade different from all the other creatures. We are vastly different from all the other creatures which is important for us to say today, because there's a whole chorus of people out there who are saying, oh no, we're we're just one shade different than a monkey. But you don't find monkeys doing seventh grade algebra. 
I mean, there is this, I would say, not just one, there is this vast difference between us and every other creature under heaven. Just the ability to communicate, think about it. We have these languages that are made up of words. These words represent ideas. We can convey those ideas to each other, even abstract ideas like we're talking about now. We can understand each other, have a back and forth about them. Two people could have a conversation about something abstract, and one person will walk away with their life changed because of what they heard. You don't have that with your parrot. You just don't. Our animals can't do that type of thing. I mean, just, okay, here's one, self-awareness. You know, many of us, we, we got up this morning, we looked in the mirror, we started doing things like this. Some of us, it took longer than others. We're aware of ourselves. Some of us came out and said, honey, do you think these pants look fat on me? <laughs> there aren't animals thinking about those things. They're not self-aware the way we are. We're aware of ourselves. We have something no other creature has. And uh, because there's chuckles, we, ability have, we alone have the ability to laugh, to, to, to joke with each other. You don't find the chicken asking the chicken why the chicken crossed the road. <laughs> Only we do that. Only we have the ability to, to laugh. And think about other capacities we have, like our emotions. We have such a broad range of emotions that no other creature has. We have to come up for words like I'm like wistful, bitter, frumpy, I mean, some of us were frumpy today, right? I mean, we have such a broad range of emotions that we can experience. Why? Because unlike any other creature God created, we have something breathed into us from God himself. We're made in his image. I mean, just think about love for a moment. We alone have this capacity to love. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing capacity that we have. And, and if you begin to think about these things, you may ask yourself, well, why? Why did God create us with this, this spiritual side of us that, that, that has all these capacities? I would say one of the things that the Bible wants to relate to you is this. We have these capacities because we are made for God. We spoke earlier, a couple weeks back, about a God who is love, and that love spills over in such a way that, that he wants others to relate to. And so he created you and I for that purpose. And it just deserves to be said in today's culture especially, we are not like every other creature. We are unique. We are distinct. There's no one else like us because God has breathed something into us from him. There's something else about being made in the image of God that I want to point out. Um, look with me here at, at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and, now this is repeated here several times, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. There's this idea of human beings ruling over everything else God's made. Look with me at verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. There's this way in which we now are like God in that we, we talked about how he's the ruler over it all. There's no other God. It's just him. But we get to share in something of who he is. And I think there's a reason. When it says here, let us make man in our image. The Hebrew word for image there actually comes from a word which means to cut, or to chisel, or to carve. And it's related to this idea of like chiseling out or carving out a statue. And um, just to kind of put it into context here, at the time in which these words were written, um, a king often did things like this. He would carve images of himself and place it all over his kingdom. So in all the various different cities in his realm, there would be an image of him. Why would he do that? to remind all the people who live there that he was the one in charge. In fact, related to that, I have this picture which I'm gonna put up on the screen. Those of you who have been around Sunlight for some time know that one of the things I like to do is collect pictures of ancient coins. 
And uh, this picture that I have is one of my favorite. I'll tell you why. This coin uh, has a picture of Tiberius Caesar on it. It's a denarius. There's a story in the New Testament, maybe you remember it, where Pharisees come and they're testing Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And you remember what Jesus says? He says, why don't you show me a coin? And they hand him a denarius. And he says, now whose image and portrait's on it? And they say, Caesar's. And uh, undoubtedly, this coin, which has been dug up through archaeology, is the type of coin that they would have handed to Jesus. And um, if you just look at the coin, you can see on the right-hand side, T-I stands for Tiberius. And then you can see Caesar along the side there. It's a picture of Tiberius Caesar. Uh, In Jesus' lifetime, there were two different people who ruled as Caesar. One of them was Caesar Augustus. Uh, But through the majority of Jesus' ministry, there was another Caesar on the throne, Tiberius. And when he came into power, he had these coins minted, and they were used all over the Roman Empire at the time of, of Jesus. Now, why do you think somebody like Tiberius Caesar would want coins with his picture on it used all throughout the empire? Why would he do that? Probably because he wants everybody to know that he is in charge, right? I think there's a similar idea here in this passage in Genesis chapter one. One of the reasons that God made us in his image, he placed his image on us, is so that as we filled the earth and subdued it, we would be like a walking memorial to this fact that God is in charge. Our job would be to put God on display for the entire universe. His image in us would be a a, a reminder, a statement to all of creation that he's God and he's in charge. Does that make sense? That's probably the idea here. So these two purposes, why did God make us in his image? One, because he wants to relate to us. And then there's a second idea that we would put on display for the entire creation who God is. Now, with that in mind, I want to start kind of walking you through the story of the Bible. Uh, You kind of begin to turn the pages. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 describes the creation of the world and then humanity. And uh, chapter 2 describes that God related to us as human beings he, he walked with us. He was with us. He talked with us. There was this loving relationship between God and the first human beings, and love was central to the purpose. Chapter 3 is a description of human beings rebelling against God and falling into sin. And at the conclusion of that chapter, because human beings have fallen into sin, they're actually separated away from God. They go out of his presence And if you begin to read forward, beginning in chapter four, it's like sin, once it starts, builds up a head of steam, and it just begins to cascade. What started as just a bite from a fruit turns into murder, and that murder turns into more murders. And already by chapter six, I want you to look with me at chapter six, verse five. We're just a couple chapters in. God takes stock and evaluates what's happened in humanity. I want you to just read this verse with me. Chapter six, verse five. It says there, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. If human beings were created in order to put God on display, how well were they doing by Genesis chapter six? Like not very well, right? Every inclination of the thoughts of their heart only evil all the time? I mean, God, who is just premier goodness, uh, are we putting him on display with, with our sin and wickedness? And by the way, if you just keep reading forward, it never really gets much better than this. I mean, when you get to the New Testament and uh, there's an evaluation of humanity, for instance, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter three, Paul says, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who seeks God, no one who understands. All have turned away. Paul says, they have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. How well are sinful humans putting God on display for the entire universe to see? The answer is, not very well. But God has this plan. I want you to turn with me 
uh, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. There's really a remarkable passage here. And we're going to start tracing this story forward a little bit. Uh, I'm sure you know the story a little bit. God, out of all the the nations of the world, decides he's going to work with one family, the family of Abraham. And he calls Abraham to himself and starts to work through that family. Eventually that family, because of famine, winds up in Egypt. They become enslaved there. At some point, the oppression is so great that they're crying out to God. God hears their cries and is coming to answer them and rescue them. And he raises up a guy named Moses that he is going to send. Um, We're going to look in uh, Exodus chapter 7. Actually, I'm going to start in chapter 6, verse 28, if you're following along, which is just a couple of verses before chapter 7 starts. It says, Now, when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. So, okay, Moses, here, you're going to be my guy. Go to the king of Egypt, go to Pharaoh, and tell him what I'm going to tell you. Moses responds, and he says to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Like, Moses is, you know, he's a stutterer. He doesn't speak well. He's like, God, you know, there are countless ways that you could speak to Pharaoh, Why me? Uh, You know, I'm sure we can all imagine the countless ways that Moses could have, or God could have showed up to Pharaoh and spoke to him. I mean, my favorite way of thinking about it is something like this, that there would be flashes of lightning and then God would just comes out with his greatest James Earl Jordan voice, Pharaoh. Whoa, earthquake. He'd be paying attention, let my people go. And you, okay, you know. Like, that would have been a great way to communicate to Pharaoh what needed to happen. Why would he show up to a stuttering man and say, you go do it? What's that about? This is God's response to Moses in verse 1 of chapter 7. It's remarkable what he says. The Lord said to Moses, see... I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. It's remarkable what what is said here. God doesn't say, well, why don't you go and convince them with fine-sounding arguments? He says, you know what? I am making you like God to him. So that when you show up, when he sees you, it's like he will see God. Turn with me a few pages forward to Exodus chapter 19. What starts here with Moses actually grows. In Exodus chapter 19, uh, by the way, it works. Moses shows up and Over the course of time, Pharaoh finally does let the people go. You know the story. They they cross the Red Sea, walls of water. Pharaoh changes his mind. He sends his army after them. Waters come crashing down on them. They get to the other side. They're rejoicing. Whoa, God, that was awesome. God then gathers them together and says, okay, that amazing deliverance you just saw, there's a reason I did that. It wasn't just so that you'd be saved. There's something I now want you to be and do. And if you look with me in chapter 19, this is where God calls all the people together. He has some instructions for them. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, if you fully obey me, And keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. This is a remarkable chapter of scripture. I mean, in all the ancient religions that are out there, there are accounts of God showing up to individual people. This, as far as I know, is the only account of God showing up to a whole group of people all at once. And he appears to them and he has this message. He says, I've saved you. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you, in verse 6, to be a 
kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Although the whole earth is mine, here's my role for you. You are going to be a kingdom of priests. Now, we've got to ask ourselves a question. What is a priest? What's a priest do? And uh, here's probably the best way I can explain it. If you were to visit a temple of some god and you wanted to know about that god, uh, the way you would find out is that there would be a priest who worked there, who, who served that god, who would come out of that temple. And if you wanted to learn about that god, you would encounter that god through the priest. I mean, the technical way of describing it is this, that the priest mediates that god to the person who's inquiring. So the idea is this, that when you would see that priest, the way he acted, the things he said, you would find out things about the God that he served. What God is saying to this nation now is this, you are going to be a whole kingdom of priests so that when people see you, how you act, what you do, who you are, when people see you, they will see me. They will know about me. That's the idea. So God to the whole Israel, you are going to be this kingdom of priests. Now, if you begin to kind of page forward in the Bible again, as you read this story, you're going to find out that there were times where Israel did this brilliantly. And other nations, they, they saw what was happening. They're like, wow, your God is awesome. And they came to worship and praise him and even bring gifts and pray tribute to God. But for the most part, if you were to just start paging through and reading the Bible, what you'd find out is that the nation did it horribly. They didn't keep God's commandments. They didn't put God on display. They didn't follow him at all. People would not have known who God was by looking at him. In fact, at some point, there was really almost nobody who was putting God on display in that entire nation. And so here's what God did. He sent his son, who, um, as the book of Colossians says, was the image of the invisible God. We're gonna talk about this passage in Colossians next week, how Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And Jesus put on display for the world to see who God was. And one of the remarkable things that Jesus demonstrated about God is this, that he's a God who will go to absolutely no lengths in order to form a relationship with us going so far as to lay down his life, die on a cross, God putting all our sins on him and punishing him in our place so that he could relate to us, so that we could be brought back into his presence. And uh, that's one of the things that Jesus demonstrated about God is there's a God who wants to forgive, who wants to love. And if you're a person who's been far from God and living your life apart from him, it just deserves to be said, and you ought to know that there is a way to come back to him through Jesus Christ. And if you haven't done so already, I just urge you to today put your faith and trust in Jesus. He, he, God wants to relate to you. He created you so that he could relate to you, and he's paved the way for you to come back through Jesus Christ. So, so come. For those of us who have come through Jesus, then we should know something. We haven't been saved just to be saved so that we could form the I've been saved.com club. That's not what God had in mind. In fact, this, this theme we've been talking about continues all the way through scripture. I'm going to put up on the screen 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter's talking to disciples of Jesus, Christians. He says this, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are called to be a kingdom of priests. We are called, now that, now that Jesus is at work in our lives, he's reforming us so that we'll, we'll more and more look like Jesus, more and more look like God. Why? So that we will put on display for the world who God is so that when people see us, they don't so much see us, they see the one who made us and the one who saved us. That, that's our job now. We are called to, to bring light into darkness and put on display who God is. So think about this a little bit. Uh, you know some of these statistics, right? There's like six to seven billion people in the world. About half of them 
Three billion are living on less than $2 a day. Just an absolute grinding conditions in poverty. Many of them just calling out, God, where are you? You don't have to think on it, such a global terms. There's people who live next door down the street from you. They've just been diagnosed. Something's happened in a relationship, it's fallen apart, they're depressed. They're struggling to just get by. They got their fist up on the air, God, where are you? And you know what? God is quietly calling down to his people, where are you? Where are you? There's a person down the street who needs God, who needs Jesus. Where are you? You were created. You were redeemed to put God on display. That's the role. That's the purpose that you now play, to shine light into people's darkness. God's calling out, where are you? And I know some of us are just like Moses. God, wait a second here. Wouldn't it be just easier to kind of James Earl Jones them? Neighbor, I'm here. But you want to know what? For some mind-blowing reason, he wants to work through people like you and me. Some of us are probably thinking, well, I mean, that's great, Scott. But you don't understand, my life is a mess. It's just broken down. I mean, how am I going to go show God to that person when I'm in this condition? And I'll tell you something. It might be that the people who were broken the most, who had Jesus come in and heal them, are the ones who are best able to put God's love on display. Maybe the fact that you're a stutterer is the reason why God speaks. Maybe the fact that you've been hurting is the way, and God, when people see the way God's loved you, maybe that's the way that they'll see the light. I don't know why God does this, but he's calling out to his people, where are you? There are people in your everyday life who need God, who need Jesus. Some of them walk through the doors today. You were created in his image to relate to him and to put him on display. People are crying out in darkness. Where are you, God? My challenge to us as a group, go be God to that person.